Right, thanks very much, uh, Ashley. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. It's great to see such a good turnout for, for this lecture. So, as Ashley's mentioned, um, we're going to give you uh, uh, sort of the best bits from uh, our work as part of the BuildOpt uh, research project. Title of the presentation, Doing More With Less, Lay Optimization of Structures. So, two speakers this, this evening. However, it's very much a team effort. So, there's been a large number of... Um, academic researchers and also uh, members of the Industrial Steering Committee who have contributed to this work, so it's definitely not just the work of uh, myself and Paul. So just say a few words initially about the BuildOpt uh, research project. Um, it's a, a joint project um, between three universities, universities of Sheffield, Bath and Edinburgh, uh, who are not uh, represented uh, by the speakers today. Uh, and the industrial partners shown on the slide, so quite a few industrial partners, um, as you can see, uh, mostly consulting engineers and also a couple of uh, industry bodies, including the iStruct T. So the aims uh, when we set out for the, to, to, to do this work was to identify um, and develop robust methods uh, of identifying layouts of elements in building structures. So what makes an efficient layout, um, for example, for a truss or... Um, for example, for a floor plate. And once we've developed those methods, um, how can we see those used in, in practice? So how can we bridge the gap between this academic work and, uh, and uptake in, in industry? Um, so a bit of background. So before I get into the um, deliverables, because it's um, perhaps an area that uh, many of you will be not so familiar with, I just want to um, sort of cover it from a sort of big picture perspective. The first is um, a slide that sort of covers the, the context. So in the 19th century, um, very often we had bespoke structures. So for example, it, on the railways we might have um, quite intricate um, structures, for example, for um, footbridges um, using... Um, large numbers of small elements arranged in a, in, a, in a pretty efficient way. In the 20th century, we kind of swept a lot of that away and we, and we basically uh, standardised where possible. So those footbridges would be replaced with big chunky plate girders, for example, in many cases. But in the 21st century, things are changing. Material consumption is becoming much more of an issue than it has been in the recent past partly due to uh, uh, CO2 emissions, we've got a climate crisis, and there's been a shift, really, in, in how that CO2 emission, how, how does CO2 emissions are actually distributed. In the recent few decades, a lot of that uh, carbon has been due to operational use, for example, heating in buildings. Um, that's now shrinking and the, uh, as a percentage, and a much bigger proportion of those carbon emissions are now due to embodied energy and the culprits of, um, of those difficult to eliminate emissions are things like iron and steel production, cement production and construction effectively is becoming an increasingly um, big contributor to global carbon emissions. So I think we need to switch from standardisation and, and reducing cost to reducing material. But the, the, the plus plus point is that new fabrication techniques are actually allowing us to effectively return to the 19th century to more complex, intricate, bespoke um, methods. Not by throwing manpower at the problem, but actually using digital um, construction fabrication techniques. So, in terms of um, what we can do to reduce material consumption, um, what we can do is we can, we can change the shape or size of members. That's something that uh, we often do anyway, um, although not necessarily that rigorously. Um, there's a recent example reported uh, where Arup um, basically optimised in every individual beam in the floor plates of the scalpel structure in central London, and they reported saving 700 tonnes as a result of doing that size optimization. So, pretty significant savings. However, what we can say from our research project is 
changing the layout of members in addition to the size is likely to give rise to even bigger savings, potentially far bigger savings, uh, depending on the, on the particular uh, situation. So if we go back um, to um, the trusses, um, what does an efficient truss layout look like? Actually, we can go back 100 years or so, and uh, there's a really nice paper from 1904 by an Australian engineer called Mitchell, and he showed that um, having an arrangement of tension and compression members that were arranged orthogonally, orthogonally should I say, um, gave rise to a minimum volume structure. So here we've got a problem where we've got two supports at the uh, locations A and B, and then a middle a vertical downward load at C, and we've got basically an arch in compression uh, uh, towards the top, and then the reverse, the tensile member um, down below. So we've got these tension compression uh, members arranged orthogonally. Now, you may say, well, that's, that's pretty um, tricky to fabricate, and, 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 and you're right, we'll come on to that, but I think it's actually a really useful thing to um, be aware of. This is when you've got a single dominant load case. Um, it's really useful to know what the best arrangement um, of members is. And this example is a much simpler one which shows the point. The first case, um, we've got um, a point load where the, uh, the two members are arranged orthogonally. And then we're basically making the angle between those tension and compression members increasingly uh, acute. And what we can see is on the right-hand side, the, the volume of material consumed is more than double. So, simple, trivial example, but it shows you um, what the effect of moving away from that uh, um, ideal structure is in terms of volume. Now, you may say um, that, that those, those acute angles are not used that widely. Well, I think the reverse is true. Um, for example, here we've got an electricity pylon uh, we see all around us, um, and clearly um, we're very often using these acute angles. And this isn't even the most extreme example, actually there's some further down which is probably even more acute. So we are using these, these, uh, these angles. Um, in a slightly more complex example, we've got a, a Pratt truss shown at the top and an optimised truss at the bottom. And again, you can see major savings by moving away from traditional in this case, 45 degree angles, moving to angles that are a little bit closer to, to 90 degrees. So this is uh, only 60% of the volume for the same deflection limit. In this case, it's spanning structure, um, a series of point loads between um, simple supports. Um, so with this knowledge, we can actually move to look at uh, common structural forms. This is a Fantastic picture um, taken in the summer um, in the, uh, in the, near the Fourth Bridges. And um, we've got the original Fourth Bridge, the Fourth Road Bridge in the foreground, and then the, the new Queen's Free Crossing. So fantastic structures. But you can see that the, the pylons, which are in compression, are not um, orthogonal to the, um, the members' intention. In this case, the main cables of the, the Fourth road bridge, and the cable stays in the Queen's Free Crossing. So that's suggesting to us that potentially these are not, um, from a structural efficiency point of view, the best they could possibly be. And one of the spin-off um, bits of work from the build-up project, which although was primarily focused on buildings, we did, we did venture into, into bridge engineering as well. Um, here we've got... Um, a rendering of a very long span bridge. These are, are, are potentially five kilometer spans where we are actually orienting the, um, or splitting the pylon instead of having a single one into, into two, or we could have three or more. And the key thing is that we showed that you could span considerably further for the same amount of material, or for a given span, then you need far less material. So actually, Compared with the Akashi suspension bridge for a two-kilometer span, you need less than half the material if you use this geometry as opposed to the geometry that was used in that structure. Now, you can argue that these very large inclined pylons are, are, are tricky to, to construct, and certainly they're unfamiliar, 
but we think it's very useful to know um, that this is the situation. And if you're interested in this, there's actually a, a paper that we published in the um, uh, Royal Society uh, A Journal uh, last year. So, big challenge, however, is how do we move from these um, potentially very complex um, Mitchell structures, as we call them, uh, such as the one on the left, to something that's more practical, such as the, um, the segment of an electricity pylon on the right. Um, what we need to do is somehow bridge that divide, and that's one of the key aspects of the work in the, in the BuildOpt research project. So, just a few words about, about, about what that approach looks like. Um, now, real-world optimization problems are complicated. They're complicated by, for example, practicalities of connections. Yeah. Certain connections are, are, are difficult to fabricate. Other connections are um, simpler. But the function associated with that is, is quite complex. Plus, if we're talking about relatively small sections, then we would use catalog sections. And so we have um, a, a design space or an exploration space which is highly nonlinear. And what engineers have typically done today is they've used um, so-called meta-heuristic or evolutionary type methods where they've tried to um, embed in the problem all that real-world complexity and then find a solution. And what they're likely to find is a solution which is in the design space, if we're plotting a volume of structure against um, um, values of design variables on the x-axis, they're likely to find a, a highly locally optimal solution. They're also in the dark as to how far away that local optimal solution is from the real global optimum, because they never find a global optimum. So to tackle that, we propose in the, in the build-up project a different way of thinking. What we do instead is we relax some of those real-world constraints which give rise to this complexity. So, for example, catalogue member sizes, we, we don't worry about that. We have um, con continuous varying uh, areas, so we allow areas to, to, to vary linearly from zero up to whatever value. And that allows us to have a, a much simpler convex optimized problem. And so this is this black line, that you, thick black line you can see uh, uh, on, the, on the slide. And we get down using gradient methods to the, glo the globally optimal problem, oh, sorry, the globally optimal solution for the relaxed problem, the simplified problem. And then in the second stage, we seek to move from that point to a, a nearby local optimum. Now, we can't guarantee we're going to get to this blue point, the, the global optimum, but we might end up at some, some other solutions which are, are nearby. And the big benefit is we know how far we are, are away from that global optimum. So if our um, step two solution is 5% um, larger volume than the, the global optimum, then we can be pretty relaxed about the quality of our solution. If it's, you know, 100% uh, bigger volume, then, then perhaps we need to review the situation. But very often, uh, we find that the solutions are not that far away. Um, but the benefit of using gradient methods is you can get to that point much, much more quickly than using the um, meta-heuristic methods, genetic algorithms, and, and other methods which have been used uh, to some extent in the, in the field. So how do we um, go about doing that um, using the gradient methods? With trusses, what we tend to do is we have, if we have a design problem where we've got a, a design space, we don't know how to arrange the members, the first thing we do is we arrange that uh, design space with nodes. We then connect those nodes with potential members, potential truss bars, and then we use optimization to find the minimum volume subset of members forming that uh, uh, optimal solution. In this case, we've got hardly any 
nodes, so we haven't got a particularly big set search space. If we put more nodes, then we'll get richer structures and we'll get closer to that, uh, um, to the true global optimum for the, uh, the problem. And what we can do is use linear optimization, uh, also known as linear programming, um, to, to find the solutions and uh, get those globally optimal um, solutions. And when I say we can solve um, um, problems quickly, it, um, we can solve problems certainly of this, of this scale in, in a very, very small fraction of 1%. We can solve problems with hundreds of nodes in far less than a second. If we want to push it, we can solve problems with tens of thousands of nodes and billions of connections on a desktop um, or a laptop computer. Mathematics, um, just, I won't go through this in detail, but basically we're minimizing the volume, which is the sum of the lengths times the area. If you've got a single load case, then you can, um, um, as a proxy for the, um, the area, you can use the, the force in the, in the member, the internal member force, and the, uh, the strength in tension or compression. So we're minimizing the volume um, subject to um, basically equilibrium. So it basically means that all those nodes you saw in the previous slide, we're looking at equilibrium in the x direction, the y direction, and in 3D, obviously, in the z direction. So this is the, the simplest possible formulation, and we can use this as a building block for more complex formulations as we see fit. But this, this is the formulation that was actually developed in the 60s, and it's extremely uh, computationally efficient. However, <laughs> uh, here's a problem. These solutions tend to be um, you know, very academically interesting, but not so practically um, useful. Uh, lots of reasons why they're, they're not practically useful. We've, we have an infinite number of very thin elements. Um, those thin elements, particularly in tension, are not going to be useful. We've got connections which are you know, um, plentiful and impossible to, um, to fabricate. Lots and lots of reasons. However, it does give us a benchmark, and we can move from this point to something more practical. Um, we can ap apply almost the same formulation, a very similar linear formulation, um, instead of to trusses, but to uh, grillages, so for floor plates in a building, for example. And what we find is um, sometimes quite surprising. So here we've got a, a distributed load, and we're finding the, um, the best layout of beams in the, in the floor plate. In this particular case, we've got a predefined um, available space for the beam, and effectively we're, we're, um, we're changing the, the width of the, of the beam. And you can see this uh, uh, unfamiliar-looking uh, um, arrangement, 45 degree angles, and this work was, uh, um, came out of the project, published um, in Optimization Journal about a year ago. Now, the big interesting um, fact is really how different that solution is in terms of volume compared with what we normally do. So, on the right, we've got what we would typically do for a... Um, a bay of a building, we have, suppose we have four columns in the corners there, and we've got primary and secondary beams, and we compare that solution to the optimized problem, where in this case we're also allowed to vary the positions of the columns. So actually, instead of applying, putting those, those columns at the corners, in this case, it's, it's told us that uh, the columns at mid faces is more optimal. The difference in volume is a factor of more than five. It's a huge difference in, in volume. We'll come back to this when we actually embed this in the, uh, in the multi-story building design. So it's giving us um, sort of new insights into familiar problems. So the first step is, is to get these benchmarks. The second step is to move into, into the real world to try to get some practical solutions. So there's a number of steps, um, sort of sub-steps in, 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 this, in this second step. First is that we 
we, we change the optimization formulation um, to rationalize the solution. That basically means changing the variables in optimization so that we also have the x, y or x, y, z positions of all the nodes. And what we find is that that uh, um, improves the, the clarity of the solution, but it also improves the, the, the optimality. Then we can simplify the solution. So, for example, we can target reducing the number of nodes or members in the, in the solution to make it more, up, more um, practical. And we can also move to formulations which are a bit more sophisticated. So previous formulation potentially will give you solutions which are in unstable equilibrium with the applied loads. So if we want to take account of system stability, we can change the formulation to, to do that. So this is um, rationalization, first of all. So what we're doing is we're moving the nodes in an initial layout optimization solution in, in, in order to reduce the um, volume. And also, simultaneously, what happens is the clarity of the solution increases. So this is the image from Mitchell's 1904 paper. The vast majority of that paper was two-dimensional, but he had one example, which was 3D. This is called the Mitchell sphere. And basically, it's a torque uh, applied, and then basically a free design space between um, the locations of the, of the applied torque. And using this method, we can get to within a fraction of 1% of the, um, the analytical solution. So if, you can, if I just restart it, so maybe I'll just pull it back to the beginning. You can see how messy it is to start with. So initially, it's quite messy because effectively, the members um, can only go to grid points, and the grid points are Cartesian, and um, that's not particularly effective when you, you have these uh, um, curved optimum so solutions. And then you can see very quickly, by moving those nodes, merging nodes, you end up with a much cleaner solution. So that's the first thing that we can do. The second thing we can do is simplify the solutions. Um, we've tried... Um, I've probably lost count of the, of the number of, of uh, methods we've, we've tried to simplify the solutions. Um, I've got one highlighted here because it's, um, it's a, a recent piece of work that's going to appear in the next uh, few weeks um, in the Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization Journal. Um, what we're doing here is we're starting with that initial formulation and we're adding some 0-1 variables where naught means uh, a member is not present in the solution and one means the member um, is present. Or we can, conversely, we can, we can have naught one variables for nodes. So we can say, is, 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 is the node active or inactive? If we enrich the formulation like that, we can very easily say, oh, give me the solution which has got no more than five nodes in it or you know, 25 members or whatever. Um, and so we've got some examples here where we have limits on the number of joints. So you can see solutions with six, eight, and 11 joints. And also we can use geometry optimization to um, move that solution to a more optimal one in the, in, the, in the way you can see. Now, disadvantage of this method, although it's very um, effective, the run times are, are long. So what we want to, to do in the build-up project is, is focus primarily on methods which could be used at a concept design stage and where you could get sort of almost instant gratification. So at the moment, this doesn't feature in our um, plugin, which um, Paul will talk about later, um, which is designed to, to do just that, to be, be quick and, and easy to use. So another method that we tried, which has proved to be more efficient in terms of computational effort, and actually, it, it, you need to pose the problem in a different way, what you do is you say, well, you solve the problem in the first stage, so you get a volume, and you say, actually, that volume is, is fine, but the associated structure is, 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 is a bit complicated. Maybe it's got um, too many uh, members in it, and you say, okay, um, let's um, see if we can reduce the number of members, but I don't want the volume to increase by more than 10% or more than 2%. So, for example, you could put in a 2% threshold and say, subjects that 2% increase in volume, show me this, this structure 
with the minimum number of members. And that allows you to, to get basically a family of solutions. So this is the optimal solution for a, a spanning structure where we've got um, simple supports at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the two edges and then we've got a point load in the middle. Um, and you can see that you can, in this case, get to pretty practical looking solutions with a relatively small trade-off. So this is only a, a few percent. Now in some problems, that unfortunately is not going to be 4%, it might be 40% or even, even more. But in this particular case, it's only 4%, so probably I would favour that simple solution in practice. <coughs> and the big benefit of this is the runtime is, is much shorter, so you can get these solutions very quickly. Um, and that also means you can apply them to, 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 to bigger problems. This is um, a, um, a, a benchmark solution for a, uh, a simple canopy, got a couple of load cases. Um, just using the layout and, and jump optimization, we end up with this, this pretty messy structure. Um, if we use this method and we say, let's um, have a, a threshold of 10%, then we end up with a much cleaner structure. So something that, you know, maybe you could um, share that with other people in the team and say, this is, this is uh, a viable um, um, candidate design. Um, and then the third thing I mentioned was, was enriching the formulation. So sometimes certain problems, for example, global stability is a major issue. In other problems where we've got you know, potentially restraint from intermediate flaws and so forth, it's much less of an issue. But if it is an issue, then potentially we want to have a more sophisticated formulation which guards against that um, um, global instability. So this is a, uh, a stadium example that we, we, we um, looked at. I think it was provided by ACOM. If you use a normal formulation, you end up with a series of basically parallel, unconnected um, cantilevers for the grandstand. If you use um, a different formulation using um, what's called semi-definite programming, so this is a... Um, a kind of a, a refinement or extension of, of, of standard linear programming. We've got semi-definite constraints where we're basically uh, in, including um, global stability. You end up clearly with these connections between these parallel trusses and you end up with something that's globally stable. And we can also include um, member buckling um, um, in, the, in the formulation as well. And there's a, yeah, there's a, a paper so I'm plugging papers because the project's coming to, uh, coming to an end, so we're starting to get papers. So if anybody's interested in this, there, there's a paper, albeit it's rather mathematical um, because it's produced primarily by our colleagues uh, from Edinburgh University who are from the maths department. Okay, so I'm going to move on to a couple of simple examples. Um, example applications, should I say. First is the transfer truss, and this is one that will be familiar to those of you who subscribe to the structural engineer, because it was in last month's um, issue. So the problem was a um, hotel block where there's um, um, loads coming up from above, and there was a need to keep free space below, and there were three stories um, in which to place a... Uh, a large transfer truss to carry this load from above and span across the ballroom in this case. And this shows the load, so we had some, some transverse beams coming in um, that provided you know, quite large um, forces, 29 meganewtons on the bottom cord of the, um, of the, of the truss, um, and some other, other loads that you can see there. In this particular case, we had intermediate floors, which could provide some, some restraint. So out of play and buckling, not likely to be too much of an issue. And this was the, sort of the, the, initial, the very initial solution that the design team came up with. Um, not saying this is the solution that they necessarily would have gone with, but this is keeping everything simple. Uniform top and bottom cord, and effectively connecting all the loads together in a sort of uh, Warren Trust type configuration. So 463 tons. If you use our optimization tool, then you end up with something 
far lower volume, although not remotely practical from an um, engineering perspective. And what we were able to do using um, various tools that we've developed is, is move to something which wasn't far off that benchmark, so 13% trade-off penalty associated with simplicity, um, so, but much, much simpler. So there's no way you could build that middle truss. The bottom truss, ah, it starts to get uh, interesting. This, is, this particular case, because of the magnitude of the forces involved, everything's going to be made from plate anyway, so we don't need to worry about standard member sizes, uh, cross, um, catalog sections and so, so maybe we can have a conversation with a fabricator to see whether or not we can, uh, we can realise this in practice. And this is um, a slide that shows um, how, you, how we got on the left-hand column from that benchmark to the, um, the, the solution that you, show, you saw on, uh, on the previous screen at the bottom. And what we've done here is we've um, effectively picked out or separated out the assumptions that, you, that we made or, or, um, in this case in order to, to, to realise uh, um, the various solutions. So the first thing is the, the benchmark is effectively taking account of force equilibrium only. We can't get away from that, so we can't ever go below that, that value. Um, and then every assumption beyond that um, is going to increase the, the volume, increase the mass, or the tonnage in this case, of the, of the structure. On the other hand, if, you, if we think about the, um, the solution um, that I showed in the first uh, image on the previous slide, um, here we had uh, constant top and bottom chord, and we also have constant uh, cross-section for the diagonals. So here we have... Um, you know, a far higher um, volume as a result of all these assumptions that you can see on the right-hand column. So it's a really nice way of um, unpicking uh, an example uh, case study problem and actually trying to understand what's contributing to the, um, to the weight and to the efficiency or, or otherwise of the solution. In this particular case, it was actually uh, done a while ago, before we had some of the, or uh, many of the automated tools that I've just referred to, um, and we actually used um, a piece of software uh, called Limit State Form, where it's actually a, a manual process. So, in this case, we're modelling half of the, the structure, um, and it's got a symmetry plane, we've got the loads, support conditions, and what we'll do is just show in real time, um, the solution of this problem. So what we're doing is we're doing the layout optimization. So the layout optimization itself, is, you can see, is, is quick. But um, prior to the introduction of some of these automatic simplification tools, we end up with something which is uh, rather, um, rather messy. So there's a bit, sort of spider's web on top of it. And the tool we, we used, we were able to actually go through and simply remove some of these small members. And at the top right, you can see a, a, a green bar which shows the efficiency. So each time we remove a member, then we reduce that efficiency. It starts off at 95%, so that's the estimate of how close we are to the benchmark. It's actually using um, the angles between members uh, to, to, to provide that estimate. So I mentioned that 90 degrees is, uh, is an optimal scenario, and it's, the difference between that is, um, is used. It's a little bit more complicated than that because we've got multiple locusts in this case, but basically, it's, in principle, it's, it's the method. And in this particular case, you can see each process is, is gradually reducing the uh, efficiency, but not by much. So we started, off, the first one I saw, I think, was 95. We're currently 94, and I think we're done. So we've actually simplified the structure, in this case manually, and got something um, that potentially is, is reasonable. 
in this particular software, also, we, we can simply draw in the Warren Trust and, uh, and do a quick comparison, and it will also automatically do the size optimization. It's very easy to, to play around, albeit in a manual way, with um, different problems. And let's get to the next slide. Going the wrong way. Um, now, you may think that's going to be really expensive. Um, as part of the build-up project, um, we've commissioned a number of, of, of model structures. We commissioned, uh, for example, a split pylon bridge, albeit far from two kilometers, more like uh, just a matter of a few meters, just to show the, uh, um, the concept. And we've also more recently commissioned uh, a couple of timber trusses, um, which we're actually in the process of doing load tests on. And this is the optimized truss, which is similar in form to the, the optimal truss that I showed in the, in the previous slide. And in this particular case, you can see we've got these, um, these slightly unusual geometries, so, so dog legs uh, and, and the like. And we've also got clearly different cross-sections depending on where we are in the span. In this particular case, we're using almost half the amount of material as the equivalent Warren truss with a constant top and bottom cord. Now, we've actually commissioned um, a Warren truss as well. At the moment, it's, 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 it's having some um, issues with the fabricator, um, um, and it's going to be coming back to us shortly. But we're hoping to do load tests just to verify that both of these trusses have the um, required um, uh, design performance, um, but this one is, I say, almost... 50% lighter. And um, the other thing to say is um, th the cost of these two trusses was pretty much identical. So there was no trade-off between the, um, um, the Warren truss and the, um, the complicated truss. So in that case, the Warren truss um, was, 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 there was some cost reductions because we had repeatability but there was more material needed, and the forces were larger. So in that case, it balanced out pretty much exactly that um, here we have less material, but um, more complex joints, and the total cost of the two trusses is virtually identical. Um, and then, I think, coming to the end of my part of the talk, before I let uh, uh, colleague Paul come in, um, I'm just going to say a few words about... Um, multi-story buildings, and this is a very idealized uh, building that I'm going to be looking at in a little bit more detail, or buildings that I'm going to look at. Now, it's interesting that um, if we step back um, and talk to the designers, some, some of the most uh, prominent tall buildings in the world, so for example, Bill Baker of SOM, a designer of uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, He's written in uh, papers and given lectures where he says he doesn't know what the optimal form for tall building is. And what the, the sort of tools that we've been uh, developing are really good at doing is shining a light on that and giving us some hints as to what that might look like. Um, some of the work we did um, early on, um, actually in sort of related projects, was um, just on... 2D cases, and in this particular case, it's a, it's a really idealized case because it's not multi-story at all. It's simply it's a single story, um, and there's various different assumptions you can make. If you make an assumption that you can only have connections at the, at the corners, you end up actually with these Mitchell-type trusses appearing in your, um, in your, in your bays, um, so telling us that actually cross-bracing is optimal if you have a one-to-one -one aspect ratios, and then for every other aspect ratio, then you end up with these more complex um, scenarios. Not necessarily practical, but interesting nonetheless. And if you're interested in that, um, there's some, some papers out, um, again, in the Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization Journal. If we move to a multi-story building, again, this is um, very, very, very idealized. Um, so in this particular case, we've got, um, I think it's 10 stories. It's a single sort of 
bay or unit, uh, and we, we try to optimise both the exoskeleton, so that, in other words, the, the, um, the outer members in the, in, the, in, the, in the structure, and also simultaneously the floor using the grillage method, then we get this um, quite complex exoskeleton, and we also get this quite complex floor, very similar to the, uh, if not identical to the example I showed before. However, we can simplify that. So we can, um, for example, um, prevent the uh, existence of, of all the columns other than the, the ones at the corners and also in mid-faces. And we can also, if we want, we can remove these 45 degree angles from the floor plate. And uh, we end up with a, um, a simpler design where we've got this sort of central spine um, configuration. And we can see that in this case, we're only 14% larger volume than we were before. But the really interesting thing is when we come to the standard multi-story building for this, this, this problem, the one that you'll see in the textbooks, where we've got four columns, each at the corner, and in the floor plate, we've got primary, secondary um, beams. This particular case has got multiple load cases. We've got, load case, we've got wind loading in the X, Y, and also diagonal direction. And we've also got gravity loading. And the number, the multiplier you get depends a little bit on, on some of the, uh, the ratios, clearly, of, of how much the wind loading is relative to the gravity loading. But we've got a multiplier of more than three. So we're saying that this standard building, um, standard academic or textbook building, is more than three times the volume of the idealized one. And what we're actually seeing is that because the floor plate actually consumes a significant proportion of the, the volume of material in a building, actually it makes sense to design the exoskeleton and the floor plate together rather than assume that we've got these um, columns at the corner and then move on to design the, um, the floor plate. So having this holistic combined optimization potentially gives us large um, savings. And at the moment we're looking at all different um, geometries, the buildings with, with, with central cores, different geometries, a uh, whole series of different uh, problems. If you a little, little flavor, um, I'm not advocating the, uh, um, the sort of goblet um, style building in the middle, but if, if, you, if you have to design a building like that, uh, you're under duress, uh, influence of uh, a prestigious architect, then at least with this technique, you can actually do damage limitation and identify what the, the best way of placing those uh, structural members is. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Paul from the University of Bath, who's going to uh, move this uh, from the, the very academic uh, um, context into a more practical context. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Matthew. Um, so I'm going to try and bring it a bit more into the context of how things get built in practice. And I'm going to do that by starting right at the beginning and see where we've come from to get to where we are today. Um, and way back in the year 1 BC, that's one before computers, people designed buildings with a paper and a pencil in 2D, like on the left. And then someone in the year one after computers, they said, oh, we can do that on the computer. So we, we designed things in 2D on the computer, just, it's just like we did on paper. And I guess the, the thing that I tell my students, really, is that CAD evolved as electronic paper. And the problem is that some of the 3D building complexity that we see today regularly, it's no longer sufficient to design in 2D as though we were using electronic paper. But luckily, thanks to computer speed and memory increases, it's no longer necessary either. So we need to take a fresh look. And things have moved on. So I've got one case study building uh, of my own, which I worked on along with Soren Jensen Architects and, uh, sorry, CF Muller Architects and Soren Jensen Engineers. And um, 
This just tries to encapsulate quickly where we are at the moment in terms of computational design. It was an extension, a, a botanical garden extension for the, um, the greenhouse, the botanical garden in Denmark in the picture. And it uses parametric modeling, which used to be a big thing, and nowadays maybe a lot of people take it for granted. Uh, and it also integrates some analysis and closes the loop with optimization. So the approach here is to use parametric modeling. It means that we set up a set of rules and we throw numbers in, inputs to those rules, and the computer applies the rules to generate shapes. So these are just a few different options for a dome-type botanical garden. Um, and the computer can generate them. In this case, I was using subdivision surfaces. But it means that we can just throw numbers in and get some options. And we can change the, the, we can say, okay, we might want to stretch it as well so that it's elliptical on plan or, or combinations of leaning it and elliptical. And the, the benefit stroke curse of parametric modeling is that it makes generating options really easy. The question is, which, which one do we build? Uh, too many options. But luckily, in computer, computational design, we can include analysis in there. So in this case, I looked at uh, solar gain, tried to optimize solar gain, um, because it was having tropical plants in the north of Denmark, so we wanted to capture sunlight. Uh, but it just it's representative of we work out an objective like maximizing solar gain, and then we can work out, we can measure the solar gain, given we know where the building is and where the sun will be, and we can look at it over different summer and winter uh, scenarios and try and work out um, the, the playoffs between all those. So we've now got a, a measure of whether a given shape is good or bad. But then we still need to explore. Do we try every single possible combination of which one's right and which one's wrong and work out the best? And uh, Matthew's touched on some of the population-based optimization that you can do. So this was a simulated annealing to help explore those millions of options. And that's kind of where we've got to as an industry, or at least the computational end of the industry. Um, and we kind of pat ourselves on the back and we do great talks at conferences about having connected lots of things together to make pretty animations. But if we step back a bit, have, have we really made a success? I went to visit this building um, in January, and it looked like that, right? So it's a nice picture. But we've solar optimized it, and there's a gray sky and a white snowy floor. I mean, so I had to go back in summer and take another photo, yeah? But it's, so it, it is a success. It's a great building, and it uses less energy than it needs to. But it, it's... I think we can do a lot more, and what I've, so what we've got now is a computational framework that we can set up a parametric model where numbers feed into rules, and the rules give us a shape, and the computer can help us assess that shape and decide whether it's good or bad. And, but more than just that, there are lots of things there on the slide that we should also be thinking about pretty early on in the design process when we're trying to work out which one's, in quotes, best. And one of the inspirations for the layout optimization project has been uh, this top quote from Sir Alan Harris, which we used in the, uh, the, grant, the bid to, the, to get the grant. And it says, actually, the significant design decision is not how big the beam needs to be, but rather wh whether we should even have a beam in the first place. Uh, and I've got a secondary quote at the bottom which says it's not which optimization method to apply, but whether we should bother optimizing at all. So I want to just pick those two things apart very briefly. The first one is about where the beams need to be. And we, to, to put it in practice, we've been around the world with our project asking people in practice the most simple question we could think of about how do we support that load midway between two pins, pin supports? How do we take that load? And, and I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna even ask you guys now, right? You're in practice. Draw with your fingers what you think the truss, pin, or pin ended truss should be. Go for it, go on, just sketch it in the air. I wanna see, do I, do I get a Warren truss? Do I get a Pratt truss? Anyone wanna sketch anything? 
Right, brilliant, right? I'm se- well, no, I've seen some triangles. I've seen someone who's been listening because Matthew's already showed the answer, right? So we've asked people around the world to do exactly this and they're all practicing structural engineers. And we got a huge range of different options. I mean, does that not worry you? This is the most simple question we could ask them and they can't even agree. Um, Now, I'm going to tell you that the Mitchell half bicycle wheel is the mathematically global optimum, and uh, Matthew's already said it. But let's say someone over there was sketching a triangle like that one there, right? How much heavier do you think the triangle is compared to that? 1%? 2? 10? 100? 1,000? Has anyone got a clue? Don't you think you should? 20. (laughs) Bit of a pessimist, but never mind. You're in the right ballpark. It's 20% heavier, right? But when that landed on your desk tomorrow morning, which one would you do? Oh, yeah, I'll do a Warren Trust job. Done. Go for lunch. Um, (laughs) so, So we need to know where these members are. And the reason I'm showing this, again, is because we build a parametric model. And we say, that's great, now we can do some optimization by changing the sliders. We can change the inputs to a parametric model. Well, if you've done a parametric model of a Warren truss, then great, you can hook up the sliders and change the height and the width and the span. And you can change it for weeks, but you're never going to come up with a half bicycle wheel. So the problem is you get early lock-in in terms of you've chosen the wrong parameters. So you're never going to get the optimized solution um, and then so so how long do you wiggle your sliders around before you decide that it's designed and go for lunch right who knows and that's where the second thing should we bother doing optimization at all well Matthew's shown this slide already and it's a real key for me if you know the global optimum <laughs> then when you're doing your design and your optimization and your analysis you can decide how f- you can know how far away you are from the optimum. So that triangular thing, is it 1% or 10 or 20 or 50? Well, if, if it's 1% more, well, you know, it's simple to biddle. Let's go for lunch. But if it's 100% more, you need to stay in and do your homework late and get it better, right? So it's really important to know how far off the optimum you are. And my, my sound bite on this one, if you want to quote me ever... Um, I think there's a famous quote, so I'm stealing it, which was, I think it was Buckminster Fuller asked Norman Foster, how much does your building weigh? Right, now it's interesting he asked an architect how much his building weighs, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's a great question, but I would, I would say, how much could your building weigh? It's no good knowing it weighs 400 tonnes if it could have been four. I was debating whether it should be could or should. So we'll take a vote later, if you like. But it, so we need to know how far off the possible weight we've got so that we can then decide what we're going to do about it. And luckily, right, I'm not just throwing, criticizing and throwing problems at you because we have a solution. And that's the output of one of the outputs of our research project is this grasshopper plugin called Peregrine. We launched it this morning. So you and the people, the people at home can like live streamers can log on and grab it now whilst I'm talking. Um, but it's live on Food for Rhino and it's also available on the Limit State website on that link there. And the the plugin, as you've seen from Matthew, takes this approach. We first do the global optimum mathematical. This is our benchmark solution, and then we've got a whole pile of tools that can help you move from that benchmark to the rational. We can rationalize it, and not manually, like Matthew is doing, clicking things and deciding which to delete. Um, but you can rationalize it. You can reduce <coughs> numbers, of, numbers of members that come into a node. You can, as he said, you can say, well, all right, I'll give you 10% extra mass to play with. Simplify it, please. So we're really going for these tools which, yes, you get your benchmark, 
Norman Foster can tell us how much it could have weighed, but he can also play and rationalise it and work out relative to that benchmark. So there's a little video here showing it in action. That is a live solution of the benchmark um, of the benchmark problem. And what it allows you to do is, right, we know that that's the optimised benchmark. Now we can try various ways of simplifying it. Another quite powerful thing that this allows you to do, well, of course, it's in a parametric environment for starters, so you can play with your sliders and see where your benchmark goes. But it also has tools, these rationalization tools that will help us make it more buildable and simplify it relative to that benchmark. You can also feed your own structure in. So you can play a game with your friends, right? You can ask them... The, the trust question, you can sketch your own solution, this thing will weigh it and compare it against the benchmark. So you can rationalize your own things, you can feed your own things in and rationalize them, or you can feed the benchmarks in and rationalize them. So it's got a lot of potential and hopefully you'll all be playing with it first thing tomorrow in the office. Um, we've had our steering committee helping us with the project as we've been going along. They've been really useful keeping us in the sort of practical mentality main mindset. Uh, so I'm very thankful for ACOM who um, lent us a case study building of theirs. And this shows you the process. On the left, we've got the design domain. On the middle, we've got the benchmark solution that is interesting. You can start to see structures coming out. You can kind of see Mitchell trusses and bicycle wheels hidden in there. But you can also say that, you know, a contractor would fall off his or her chair when they were asked to build it. But then we can rationalize it down. And we've got the benchmark to compare against. Uh, Arabs have been using this quite uh, intensively in their office uh, as an educational tool for their engineers to start thinking about things and how they design and how they scheme design, as well as trying it out on some practical projects. So they were very kindly um, lent me this case study to show you, which was an existing stone stair that they needed to support with some structure underneath. The, ex the original design for the, for the support steelwork weighed two and a half tons. They thought it might be interesting to throw it into the plug-in and they got a 50% reduction. They, but then they kind of looked at it and go, oh, of course, it's arching, right? So it, it's, it's already suggesting what it wants to do, but if it's arching, that's a bit unfair because it's putting thrust down onto the supports, which the original one wasn't. So they released the thrust restraints at the base uh, and got a different solution. It's still 23% less than the original, and it's respecting the boundary conditions a bit more. So they're using it, you know, you know, to to give ideas and to understand. You know, you don't need to build it, but you can start to see. Oh, well, maybe we could arch. Maybe we could thrust. Maybe we could Mitchell truss a bit more. They've also been using it really early in scheme design. So they shared a few. These aren't, aren't necessarily real projects, but they were, they were just kind of saying, well, I wonder what it could do, how, how, what it might suggest to us as a solution um, for this. Uh, I think it's a bit like a stadium roof. It's not a real project, but they were a, sort of I, ideas, concept designing with it. Um, and, you know, we, we can discuss about whether it's buildable or not, but you can, you can kind of pull out some ideas. They particularly liked this. Uh, this feature where you can say, well, actually, you know, it, there's a lot of dissimilarity around, but we, there's, a, there's a kind of bicycle wheel happening there, and maybe we could use that feature, talk to the architects about how we might use that. So I hope that in the very near future, rather than seeing things like that, we'll start seeing things like that, uh, where people are starting to think twice before they just knee-jerk draw a warrant for us and go for lunch. Um, so to, to encapsulate really what, I, what both of us have been trying to say, I just want to reiterate that we think layout optimization itself is a really powerful but underexploited tool. You should all hopefully, if you haven't seen it before, go away and think about what it can do for you. The real key for me is this two-step approach. It's let's see what, what you could never beat, and then let's see how we can rationalize away from it 
remembering to benchmark ourselves against the, optima, the global optimum. Because this, this uh, mathematical approach can very quickly give the globally provable optimum. And that's quite a thing that we have a tool in our toolbox that we've never really chosen to use. Uh, so we can benchmark against it as well. And we've seen throughout the three and a bit years project that sometimes unexpected solutions come out. And we can learn from them, and, and we've seen p significant material savings that have surprised us quite a lot. Um, so luckily, we've got a Rhino Grasshopper plugin that everyone can, as of today, everyone can use. Uh, it will be developed further over the next, um, well, hopefully forever, but at least we've got uh, a p project on the go at the moment to make sure it's developed for the next 12 months um, to make this sort of design easier. And the, there is other things going on in this space as well, which is great. The, Matthew's involved in the in, integrated project, um, sorry, uh, which is looking at fabrication of joints using man, uh, additive advanced manufacturing processes. And I'm involved in automated dot construction, uh, which is looking at uh, Similar ideas about minimizing material use, but for concrete structures rather than steel. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that advert as a reminder, but I just want to finish by challenging you all. I think anyone, I would say anyone whose company has signed the structural engineers declare or the architects declare should be going into their office tomorrow morning and saying, why aren't we doing layout optimization as company policy on all scheme designs? Because if you don't do it at scheme design, it will be too late, and I don't want to see any more Warren trusses. Thanks very much. <laughs>
I, I, don't, don't qualify it, it's fine. But Mathematically, it's, it's not true, no, but who cares? It, well, it's not, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, the, the real problem, with all the complexity, does have a global optimum. It's just that the devil is finding it. So what we, 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 you know, we've got a, a compromise, which is to relax a few things, mm -hmm. get to the, idea of the relaxed global optimum solution, and then look for solutions in that, in that area. But the key thing is you know how far away from the global you are, so you can make an informed decision whether you're happy with it or not. Okay, thank you. Hope I didn't start an argument. <laughs> <laughs> One over there somewhere. Thank you for the very uh, interesting uh, talk. Um, I mean, to me, this is, has been counterintuitive counter in a way because uh, there are l many more members than what you would expect to see in the solution. Um, and somehow I can see, and you have explained it very well, that the more practical solution that is practical to build is a compromise between too, too few elements and more elements. Um, but uh, something that I sort of, um, I'm not sure if, if, if it was correct on one of the, 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 the slides was uh, the comparison of, uh, of the tower with four columns, one on each corner. And then the optimal solution had eight columns. So in a way, you're sort of, we're not comparing apples and pears there because it would be very different to have um, that sort of arrangement. You have more columns. So I just wanted to, to understand what was your, your, your point of view on that. So, so for that particular problem, um, what we had, the design objective is to keep free space in the interior of the building. So we had 10 rooms, if you like, on top of each other. And we can have structural members on the floor plates and we can have structural members on the, the faces of the building. And that's it. So what it's telling us is that the, the usual assumption is that you, you place your columns at the, at the four corners is the best solution. Now, it might be the best solution if you think of lateral wind loading in isolation, but in reality, you've got gravity loading um, to consider as well. And with gravity loading, you could see from the earlier slide that it actually makes sense to, in a sense, rotate the, um, the direction of the floor spanning round through 45 degrees and instead concentrate the loads at the midpoints mm -hmm. Now, in reality, when, you, when you're dealing with um, real building design problems with design load cases, you, you're always going to have that gravity load. So why not have that gravity load carried in an efficient way, and then the corner columns can deal with the, um, the wind loading? So, well, you're right. If, 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 you, if you, only, you could only deal with, uh, if you only allowed four columns, then you know, we'd end up with a, you know, a different, slightly different outcome from what we, what, what we, what we shared. And uh, this... Um these tools that you're presenting, do they do the analysis and design at the same time and they're optimizing or what, what, what this is actually doing? So, so if, we, if we go back to that, um, that mathematics page I, I glazed over, it, it, it's, it's kind of analysis in its simplest way. So it's force equilibrium, so you know, method of joints, so it's sizing up the members. It's a, it's, in a single load case, um, you don't need to worry about how the material behaves, but in a multiple load case, we assume a plastic idealization. So we're assuming everything's yielding at that mm -hmm. limit in tension and compression. So it's a, it's a first order basic analysis is built into the, um, into the program. And it, it's actually, it's quite different from the way many, um, oh, uh, many people have used optimization in the past. Often they've, they've, they've effectively linked a, a, a geom geometrical model to an FE program and then had this loop going back. Here it's all built in, in into one algorithm, mm. effectively. But Thank we're you. Purpose, yeah. We're purposely not doing code design on this. Mm -hmm. This is telling you where to put the beams and what the benchmark is. You can design it through design codes later on. Thank you, thank you. That answers uh, the, the question very well. And, and I'll just go back to your, question, your point about intuition and push it back. You said, I'm really pleased that you found this non-intuitive. What is intuition, right? You base your intuition on what you've already seen. 
If we stick that way, we'll have Warren trusses forever, right? And in 10 years, I want intuition to be a bicycle wheel. Uh, in defence of Warren trusses, they're much better than <laughs> Pratt trusses. Yeah. I'm nothing against Warren, right? But... <laughs> Have you tried uh, throwing these solutions at the fabricator and see what they say? Uh, well, you, yeah, I mean, he's built the wooden one, right? And I think it's hilarious that the Warren Trust was the one that had to go back because of a bit of an error on the fabrication. So <laughs> they go, oh, that'll be too difficult to build, but they messed the regular one. I, I, th I think what, what, they, what they did, and um, I, I have to be careful what I say because I, I, I don't know, but maybe it looked too easy, so they got their apprentice to, to make it. And <laughs> <laughs> took care over the difficult one. Over the difficult yeah. one. Have you thought of any other um, sort of um, suitable fabrication method that could enable us to come up with more, more optimized uh, designs and actually build them? Have you thought about uh, actual methods? So I think in, in this penultimate slide, I think um, Paul um, showed that we're, we're, we're looking at, for example, um, large-scale metal 3D printing for very complicated scenarios. But in reality, um, I think there's the scope to um, build in more conventional constraints and build those into the optimization. And then effectively you have a slider, and it might be that your optimum truss actually has you know, 20, 20 conventional joints, and just one joint is, is, is more complex. Maybe it's 3D printed mold and then a, a casting. Um, but if that saves, the, you know, saves 100 tons of material on, on 20 trusses, then it might be that that's, that's worth doing. But what it's doing is shining a light on um, what you can, um, what, 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 what you've, it goes back to what, I think what Paul said, he said, is it worth optimizing? So I think it, it shines a light on the problem so you can actually start to make informed decisions in a way that I guess we haven't really um, often in the past. Is it, is it worth having this complex joint? And, and if it's only a few percent heavier to have a Warren truss, then the answer is no. If it's 100 percent heavier and you've got lots of trusses, then maybe the answer is different. Yeah. At least you can have that conversation. Thanks. Okay. There's one right at the back. Do you want to shout or shout into the microphone? Hi. Um, I was just wondering how it deals with various load cases and kind of pattern loading. Because by my understanding, it works out on optimization for a set of given loads. Is, is that solution then kind of um, tested against the various other load cases and patterns that could be happen? Um, so the, the, the slide I showed on the maths was for a single load case, but it's very easy to have um, in as many closes, as many load cases as you as you want, basically. So. What you would have is, um, you know, clearly a cross-sectional area for every every member, and then for each of the load cases, you're you're, you're looking at the forces, and um, the, the area needs to be big enough for the internal force distribution in, in each and every one of the load cases you consider. What I would say is that um, if you if you give it, you know, 100 load cases, it will it will take you know forever to solve. Um, so in reality, it makes sense in the conceptual design stage is to put the two or three or four um, dominant load cases and then effectively refine and check for you know, the other um, however many dozen load cases that you might have to consider in, in certain cases. Thank you. Does superposition work actually? Does it effectively take school classes? Um, superposition doesn't work. Um, um, well, there's a... I'd, the, the, for, for the case of two load cases, there is um, the, there's actually some theoretical method which allows you to to construct a solution from the superposition of two load cases, but it's not that intuitive. So probably not not the superposition you're thinking of. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello. And the results look very similar, like a topologic optimization, when you have your parametric model composed with uh, tiny cubes, and then you start extracting the material, and the result looks very similar to when you go to layout optimization and rationalization. There's something similar behind in the logic, 
And then the second question is, when you do the optimization, are you applying um, genetic algorithms? What kind of uh, genetic algorithms are you applying? Or may, may I ask this question? Or okay. <laughs> you, you, you can ask, but as you're at the back, I'll assume you, uh, you, you entered the room late. <laughs> um, so the, in the first question, um, continuum topology optimization is, is, has been widely used for some years, particularly in mechanical aerospace. Um, it's very useful for problems where a relatively high proportion of the design space is going to be occupied by structure in the final um, solution. So if you're if you effectively saying, I've got a, a compo existing component, I want to shave some material off, it's very effective. For the sort of skeletal structures that structural designers deal with, where you're talking about you know, often a vanishing percentage of 1% of the design volume that's occupied by structure, they're not very effective. Um, and also they're very slow, uh, extremely slow for that, for that scenario. And you spend a lot of time working out how to put sticks back up the answer, whereas if you use sticks in the first place, they come for free. Yeah, you have to fit the stick back in. Yeah. So, so going back to the question about the, the, the way it does it, it's using classical mathematical optimization gradient methods. So there's no um, genetic algorithms um, whatsoever. This is, this is going back to basics, back to maths. Uh, that's why we involved the maths department in the project. So they're keeping us on the straight and narrow. I think we were definitely gen genetic algorithm free um, throughout, throughout the project. That's how it's able to say this is the absolute global optimum and you will never beat it. With a genetic algorithm and those types of approaches, you cannot say that. You've no idea how close you are to the optimum. Um, do you think it's possible to look at optimizing materials as well? Uh, have you possibly looked at trying that out? Um, so mixing concrete, steel, timber, the sort of elements that would be used in most construction. So, you know, for a multi-story building, you use, say, concrete for your columns and for your... Um, yeah, you know, just stick to steel beams or trusses and... Well, this is deciding where to put the elements. So there's an element there or there isn't. If you change the material, it would change the volume of that element, but it wouldn't change whether there's an element there or not, would it? Um, yeah. it, it, it if, so if you put, put in a cost function that's different, obviously, for, for different materials, so concrete is, you know, it's, has a particular performance in compression and, and, and obviously a, a different performance in tension. So you could, you can change objective function so you're minimizing cost or some other um, parameter that you're interested in where potentially it could come up with a solution where it's a hybrid structure with some concrete elements and some, some steel elements in tension, for example. So you, you could do it. It's, it's relatively simplistic, as you see from the formulation slide before. So it, um, the basic formulation is simply down to tension and compressive limiting strength. You can apply a cost function on top of that, but still, you know, um, yeah, work for the future. Okay. Um, I think we'll have to leave it there. Yeah, okay. Um, if, do you take questions on your Twitter? Absolutely. I'm, <laughs> I'm short of followers, so please all follow. Oh, the build-up um, build one is there, yeah. and mine was on the first slide.